what's left of a forest in the Siletz watershed. It's really much like a museum exhibit. You know, it's a look back into the past. This is uh, 51 acres of original forest. So we're talking about a tiny uh, postage stamp here. And we're right now we're in like the holy water, the headwaters where the, the fish spawn, or a lot of the fish spawn. I have a lot of friends, you know, who've moved to Oregon in the last 10 years, and they bring with them notions of Oregon forests. And this is what it looks like. They imagine lots of moss, huge trees, big ferns, salmonberry, uh, and then they go drive around and they don't see that anywhere. I mean, in fact, you know, we had to drive hours to get here today to this 51 acres of remaining original forest. This is all that remains. So here we are in the uh, industrial cut zone. You can see how extensive these cuts are and also just how young they all are. Almost the entirety of the basin has been cut in the last 10 years. So the companies you know, that own these lands and are also managing themselves with the help of the Oregon Board of Forestry, they are gambling on the best interests of all the people who live in this watershed and love this watershed. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> the Siletz is a snapshot of iconic landscapes and watersheds all across Oregon, where liquidation of private forest lands is affecting the public commons. Hidden from the public eye, locked behind gates and shielded beyond the beauty strips, these are the stories from behind the Emerald Curtain. Our resources have been used to serve huge corporate industries just past this little tiny wall of green trees and out behind our house is actually just miles of devastation. Oregon is this interesting state in that it's perceived as being this very green, progressive state, but some of our laws are actually quite regressive. To see the magnitude of clear cuts in square miles is nothing short of flabbergasting. We tend to opt towards privatizing the gain and socializing the pain. We're not arguing that they don't cut these forests. Uh, what we're arguing for is balance in how these forests are managed. The Oregon coast is a national treasure, but an outdated set of 40-year-old laws on private timber lands under the Oregon Forest Practices Act is putting at risk the health and wealth of communities and watersheds that depend on this salmon-based ecosystem. For millennia, Salmon thrived in the cool waters provided by temperate rainforests and small spring-fed streams. These tributaries were the capillaries that formed the river. Fall marked the largest runs of salmon that brought in marine nutrients which fertilized and fueled a complex web of life. Trees that fell in the forest gave life to new trees, just as the salmon that died gave life to new salmon. There was a symbiotic relationship with life and death in the forest. This was nature's way of engineering an ecosystem.
During the freshets of winter, the forests would anchor the slopes and absorb the heavy rains. But when they took the trees, the land became unstable. You know, we're already losing the fertility and the fecundity of the soil because you cut on a steep slope, it rains, and you lose that topsoil. These places where the soil has pulled free, in many respects, this is the most long term of the damage that we see in these clear cuts. These soils take tens of thousands of years to build, and when they're gone, they're gone. And what holds these soils to the hillsides are these tree roots. If you have an entire watershed that's clear cut in a decade or two, or even three, you'll have a major portion of that landscape that is in a state of a reduced root strength for a fairly long period of time. And if you happen to get that 50 or 100 year storm during that period, you'll have a lot of the land being essentially vulnerable to sliding at a higher rate than it would have without that kind of practice. Thousands of miles of logging roads were carved out of the landscape, triggering landslides and transporting sediment to the rivers below, which created torrents of mud that suffocated salmon eggs and delivered dirty drinking water to communities downstream. Essentially, when we have these big clear cuts and these roads, we're increasing the frequency of our of landslides in the basin uh, from what they would be naturally. And as a result, we're getting just massive amounts of fine sediment ending up in the river. During summertime droughts, the large trees captured fog off the Pacific Ocean and would convert the moisture to water, which contributed up to a quarter of a watershed's flow. Today, there are very few areas with large trees left to collect the fog. The feeder streams are logged over, and only a small buffer of trees is left for shade along the main river itself. Water here bakes in the sun all summer. That higher temperature just runs downstream too into the main river, bumping the water temperatures there. Those headwater streams, those sort of steep, small, non-fish-bearing streams, are a key link in the, the chain of processes that create and maintain and can alter and destroy salmon habitat. Salmon are the ultimate indicator species for ecosystem function and health. And with the Oregon Coast coho listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, the fish are telling us we need better stream protections. The forests of the Oregon coast were some of the largest carbon banking systems on Earth, sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere. We live in an area in western Oregon where the density of carbon, the amount of carbon per acre stored by an ecosystem is higher than almost any other place in, in, in the world. When we cut that down then, we emit more carbon dioxide per acre than any other place in the world. The forests were rich in biodiversity, which acted as a biosecurity holding the ecosystem together. The diversity has been simplified with the application of herbicides, pesticides, artificial fertilizers, and rodenticides that create a vast monoculture of Douglas fir saplings across millions of acres of Oregon's landscape. This is how humans have engineered an ecosystem, and it's called a working forest. Certainly, if an herbicide is effective at killing streamside vegetation, it's certainly effective at killing aquatic vegetation that jumpstarts the food web in our freshwater ecosystems. These herbicides that they're using are very harmful to aquatic ecosystems. Salmon actually are highly sensitive to any kind of um, toxin. One of the chemicals that they use um, is atrazine quite a bit, and that's actually banned in the European Union. It um, actually turns male frogs female. The federal government banned spraying chemicals such as atrazine on public forest lands in the 1980s. Spraying continues on private lands, and there is little regulation, information, and enforcement on what they are spraying, when they are spraying, 
or whom they are spraying. There's about a 12 mile an hour wind uh, blowing it right at me. Look at the drift on this right here. Holy moly. It's drifting hardcore, even though it's on their property, but they say drift don't happen my ass. And I'm about to get ready sprayed right here. It's coming right up the hill at me. No way to avoid it. I'm gonna be hacking for weeks. The bigger issue in our town, though, is the air quality in the matter of drift. But the response in this community was nausea, headaches. There are a number of elderly residents here. There are a number of people that can't just jump in a car and leave town. And you know, nobody, as far as I can tell, can, can give me hard answers to give to the people in my community to say, this is how you will be affected by drift. Private industrial timber lands make up the landscape behind Wheeler and it's all been clear-cut in the past decade. When a town or home sits at the base of a clear-cut that is sprayed annually with herbicides and pesticides, chemical drift is inevitable. And I started spraying, but by that time, when I understood what was going on, it was too late for me, and I could feel myself starting to collapse. And since I live right above the clinic, I literally staggered out of my cabin and down the road and down to the clinic and got in the door and got to the front of the counter and then collapsed totally because at that point um, it was coming in so heavily into the clinic itself and then I go into this kind of seizure thing and I, I can't communicate. I, I communicated when I got there, said what was going on and then that was it. I couldn't really respond to anything. They picked me up and took me in a room in the back but that room was still, it had the the scent of that spray all through the clinic. Over at the care center, according to reports that I heard from people who were working in there, their eyes were burning. The air system in there was pulling the fumes right into the care facility and circulating them around. There's an Alzheimer's unit over there. There were people who were just going off. I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but I am concerned about the science of, can somebody give me a hard answer as to what I can tell people in this community to, to expect? After years of complaints all across Oregon, Senate Bill 613 was introduced in an effort to offer some modest protections to citizens from chemical trespass. It was going to create buffers around schools and homes, very sensible things. It was going to create a process for creating buffers around streams and drinking water sources. Couldn't make that through the Oregon le legislature. Industry lobbyists have access and citizen advocate groups do not based on how much money they're willing to, to donate to the political process. The agencies became very politicized and they became over the years captured by big industries. Using chemicals to manage forests is one of the ways industry has imposed an industrial agriculture model on natural ecosystems. Ownership of land has also been changing. Between 1996 and 2007, 84% of the nation's privately owned industrial timberlands have changed hands. The ownership of these lands has changed. So that instead of being owned by a local family that lives in the community and, ha and realizes some responsibility to the members of its community, those lands are now owned by large corporations, by insurance companies or by other major investors that are solely ma managing those lands to generate short-term incomes for the shareholders of their company. Coming up, a different type of investment, how timber and natural resources can complement your portfolio. Timos and treats. We've got a twofer. Yeah, a twofer <laughs> because they're both ways to invest in timberland. So Timos are timberland, not timber, timberland investment management organization. Weyerhaeuser announced a number of strategic moves over the last day or so. We have seen the number of logs exported go from about one in ten to about one in five. Some 
people within the industry have reported that last year, in 2014, one log out of two was being exported. What does that mean? That means that we still can create some jobs to cut the trees down and put them on a truck. But then that truck just goes to the port, those logs go onto the ship and they're gone. Those logs don't go to a mill, they're not processed, we don't see all of the uh, accompanying jobs associated with the processing of those logs. And so in effect what we are doing is we are taking logs and exporting all of the jobs that are associated with those logs. Well the story of Oregon and timber has been that Oregon has just been a colony for either other nations, particularly Japan in the 1980s that took our timber, um, and a colony for very big industries that have cut and run. We also know that in the past, the industry paid a harvest tax. So it paid a tax when it cut down trees, and that tax was supposed to help support economic development in the communities that were surrounded by the lands that had just been logged. The timber industry no longer pays that tax. It does pay a tax, but that, the money from that tax goes to support the industry itself. 28% of timber tax revenue that once went to rural communities and schools now goes to the Oregon Forest Resource Institute, a public relations firm driven by industry. A bird's eye view of Oregon forests is pretty spectacular. What's even more spectacular is that many of these are working for us. Oregon has strong laws that help protect our watersheds. And besides, it's the right thing to do. We gotta have clean water. Plus buffers of trees help ensure cool, shady streams that are great for fish and wildlife. Most of us believe that, um, you know, the taxes that come off of these timberlands, what little they are, could be put to better use other than a public message that says everything's just fine with our forests. In Washington, the industry still pays a timber harvest tax that goes to counties. And if Oregon had a very similar tax, Oregon's counties on the western side of the Cascades would be receiving about $40 million a year. So what we're seeing is that the external costs, what economists call the external costs the industry imposes on the rest of us are growing. The industry's compensation for that has basically disappeared. My name is Kate Taylor. I live in Rockaway Beach, Oregon. My boyfriend Justin and I chose to live in this quaint little cool coastal community and run our travel company and fishing guide business out of this area. We bring guests from all over the world to experience the wild rivers of Oregon. So we saved up our money, bought a house on the Oregon coast, and immediately got notices in the mail from City Hall saying that um, our water was contaminated. It wasn't meeting the EPA guidelines. I turned on the tap to get some water and the smell of bleach, the smell of chlorine hit me pretty strong. When I met Nancy Webster on the beach walking her dog and we were walking ours, I asked her, where does our water come from? And she pointed up uh, to some massive clear cutting and said, right there is Jetty Creek. That's where your drinking water comes from. They've logged over 80% of it, and they also do aerial sprays in that area. You should be concerned. This is Jetty Creek, which is the sole drinking water source for Rockaway Beach citizens. There was so much turbidity in the last three years when they were logging that there's more dirt coming off the hill, runoff, then they have to add more chlorine. More chlorine equals trihalomethanes. We were above the limit of trihalomethanes for two and a half years over the EPA limit. Trihalomethanes are formed as a byproduct, predominantly when chlorine is used to disinfect water for drinking. Trihalomethanes are also environmental pollutants, and many are considered carcinogenic. The city has since then installed a sand filter as an attempt to deal with the trihalomethanes. That seems to be working. I don't think that the logging uh, company owners, the ones who made money off of logging those, those trees in our watershed, paid for our drinking water upgrade. The city of Rockaway Beach recently spent $1.6 million updating their water system. 
So if a watershed has been providing very clean water to a city and the city has not had to incur very many costs in order to use that water and distribute it to its customers, but now because of logging that water becomes very dirty, in effect the city has to pay money in order to take that dirt out of the water. And so that's part of the value of having a, an ecosystem provide those services rather than having concrete or a concrete system provide those, those services. From 2014 to 2015, 37 public water systems in Western Oregon exceeded maximum contaminant limits from dirty water. But the reality is, is that property rights also have a flip side, and that's what I like to call property wrongs. And when you start looking at the way that an impact can propagate off of one's property to impact a, a neighbor's property, or a public good, like a, like a river or stream, for example, and the public trust is very simple. Its logic says that all of these natural resources that are crucial to our survival and well-being are held in trust by the government for the citizens of the sovereign, the citizens of the state, and that they're held in trust for present and future generations of citizens. So the public trust principle stands for basically one thing that one generation should not use up and destroy uh, all of these vital natural resources to the detriment of future generations of citizens. Locally, we formed the Rockaway Citizens for Watershed Protection. We're looking at uh, uh, seven acres of wetland that was logged uh, you know, uh, I, I would think illegally, but uh, supposedly it, uh, it's, it's within the law to log uh, seven acres of a wetland, so. Uh, pretty devastating. Kind of looks like the moon. It's a real shame. This is the get the dollar now, and uh, in, in, in 20 or 30 years, we'll, we'll let somebody else worry about it. The creek comes down the hillside, and where it would have gone down into Jetty Creek, there's a road that's placed over the top of it with no culvert. There's no way for it to free flow. It basically stops right here. And then as it goes down, it picks up more and more sediment. And that just, again, washes down into our drinking water. And 82% of this watershed has been logged. That means that 82% has been sprayed. There have been numerous cancer-causing herbicides sprayed in the Jetty Creek watershed. These chemicals are often combined in batch trucks, and little testing has been done on the reactions when these chemicals are combined. There was one ad hoc testing done in 2013, and one of the pesticides used tested positive in our water. There's no reason they should spray in our watershed, and there's no, I am becoming, there's no reason they should be spraying on the slopes near us. There's just no way, I mean, the city could do a better job of notifying people, and we need to really work on that. So when we called the Oregon Department of Forestry, we were told that we had to pay to register with their program. The fact that you have to pay $25 to be notified about whether they're going to spray in your backyard, literally a quarter of a mile as a crow flies from my house, is, it's tragic. You have to pay to find out you're gonna be poisoned, which is pretty, 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 uh, pretty off, this, off the scale there of, rea of what ought to be reality. Are there any doctors that are willing to step up and say this person has so much of a level of the, what is it, glycogen or, glyophosphate in them or, you know, I've talked to a few people and they've, there have been cancers around here. I have personally just finished a round of cancer surgery and chemotherapy. Several of my neighbors are in the same situation and we can't help but wonder if there isn't a correlation. And I think the timber companies, my understanding, overall are not breaking the law. This is what the laws in Oregon say that they can do. And so we really need to look at, this is our Forest Practices Act and it's not adequately protecting the citizens, the rural people that live on the coast. Government is trustee 
of these resources and the citizens have a right to hold their government accountable in managing the resources that are so important to our survival. Rockaway Beach and the Jetty Creek watershed is not an isolated situation. The entire Oregon coast is not meeting federal water quality standards with logging along streams being the main culprit. There are alternatives to the current cut at any cost industrial model that are affecting the public trust. Peter Hayes of Hyla Woods is managing his forest lands for the future. Uh, our family's been active in forests since 1845. So it's, it's a business, and it's a business that's designed to work as well or better in the long run as it is in the short run. So we're, uh, we have to make enough to keep it going day to day, year to year, um, but our focus really is uh, as an experimental forest on restoring the health and wealth of the land, which we think makes good business sense in the long run. I mean, if I think of the forests of Northwest Oregon that I grew up in starting in the mid-1950s, uh, it's very different that we've lost a lot of that um, complexity and opportunity and as a result for instance in this corner of Oregon there are 38 different species that are either already extinct or in serious trouble. So this overall stand has been logged maybe five times over the last 30 years and it's an effort in variable density thinning to figure out how much we have to thin to get an understory to start growing up and then to your left here, you can see an example where we actually tried a, another experiment where we opened up a patch opening and then planted it to, I think there are four different species, but also you can see from these young seedlings that it's a small enough opening that the, the forest is reseeding itself. So here, natural dug fir, natural grand fir, and, it, and it's very complex. So you have to have the strengths of the ecologist with the practical sides of a logger. If we had clear cut this, for at least the first 15 years, a lot of the solar energy coming into the site would not be going into trees, it would be growing into other shrub species. Uh, whereas if you practice a sort of continuous cover forestry and think of these all as like solar panels, that, that light that's providing the energy of the forest is really going into trees. So it seems to make more sense if you really wanna maximize solar, converting that solar energy into the carbon and the growth in the tree is to have your solar panels collecting as much sun as possible and not have the sun going in places where it's just gonna grow things that you might not want. So not only do we wanna have it conserve what's here, but we have the higher goal of wanting to restore what's here, but do it in a way that makes enough economic sense that uh, it's a replicable model. Um, and part of that is for society to decide that some of the things that it values but doesn't price actually need to be priced. So we provide clean, cold water. You can hear the birds singing, those kinds of things that the only thing the landowners are paid for in general are saw logs. So we shouldn't be surprised that in that model, people maximize the one thing that you're paid for. Um, so if we're gonna have new models, it's not just about us working alone, but working in partnership with lots of other people. Oregon can do better for its fish, wildlife, clean air and water but it all starts with managing forests based on science and reforming the Oregon Forest Practices Act. Uh, and so when people say Oregon's forests are healthy, the forests on public land are healthy. The forests on Oregon's private land in places like this, this is not healthy. Washington and California both have more stringent laws on private forest lands than we do here in Oregon, and yet the timber industry still thrives in each one of those states. Is, is the maximum profit for out-of-state investors more important than the welfare of our people? As we become more sophisticated about understanding the nature of the ecosystem, goods and services that natural systems can provide us, we can start rethinking the, the touch with which we manage them. If we protect streams and we don't spray chemicals right into streams and we have healthy fish populations, that benefits coastal communities. It's our children and our grandchildren who are going to pay the price for what we've done. And it's a travesty and it needs to stop now. We need to educate the public as to the importance of the watersheds. The trustee cannot manage the public resource for the primary purpose of benefiting a private party. We definitely need preserved areas, but we need working forests 
that are functional economically and ecologically. And we have no excuse not to succeed. I mean, we've got so many opportunities here. The question remains, at what length do we allow actions on private land to affect our public comments? Thank you.